Good afternoon. Welcome to Optimal Care Pediatrics, a brand new pediatric facility in St. Lucie West. I'm Dr. Mondesi, a general pediatrician. Um, today we'll be talking about safety and more, more specifically summer safety. So today I have Lori Maddick from Martin Health Systems and Rhonda Sorelli from Safe Kids. Um, they'll be joining us for our talk today. We got a lot of questions in, so a really nice response. I hope we get through all of the topics today. Um, you can also send in questions uh, throughout the talk. All right, so let's begin. Lori, did you want to introduce yourself? Oh, I, I will. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting us to be here. Um, as Dr. Mondesi said, my name is Lori Maddock. I'm a registered nurse, and I'm the nurse manager of the new pediatric unit at Tradition Medical Center. We have a beautiful new eight-bed pediatric unit that we hope your children do not have to use this summer. <laughs> I'm Rhonda Sorelli. I'm the Safe Kids Program Director for St. Lucie County. Um, Safe Kids is a coalition here in St. Lucie County with about 20 members who are working to reduce unintentional injury and death to children uh, in St. Lucie County. Okay. So first question, um, what age can babies start using sunscreen? Well, um, the recommended age is not before six months. Up until six months, baby skin is very sensitive, hasn't fully developed yet. So we recommend that children less than six months of age stay out of the direct sunlight. In addition, you would want to limit activities during the highest peak sun time during the day, which is about 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., after six months of age, you can start using sunscreen on your children. If it's normal activity during the day, such as walking to school or to the grocery store or whatever, an SPF of 15 is recommended. If there are outdoor activities going on, it should be at least an SPF of 30 up to 50. And actually, it's um, recommended that after an SPF of 50, that it's really not any more um, you know, beneficial than an, a lower SPF. Um, the difference, I just wanted to add to that the difference between the UVA and the UVB rays. The UVA rays penetrate deep in the dermis, and the UVB rays, they just burn the superficial layers of the skin. Um, very important to reapply every two hours. So especially after sweating or the kids are outside playing for a couple hours, um, they'll need to, you know, pat them off and then reapply that sunscreen um, after swimming as well. Um, if the sunscreen irritates the skin, just try a different brand. If they break out in a rash, definitely come to the pediatrician. Okay. It's also um, very important to not um, ignore the fact that children can still get sunburns if it's cloudy outside. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. you still want to take those precautions with sunscreen on a cloudy day if you're going to be outside at an activity. Yes. And also to add to that, dark skin babies can still get sunburn and still require sunscreen as well. All right. Um, and can you comment on hats and clothing to wear to the pool or uh, out to the beach? Absolutely. So children should have a hat on, again, because that direct sunlight can be um, very harsh on their skin and you don't realize how quickly a child can get a sunburn. Children should also wear sun shirts. There are shirts available that actually do protect from some of those UVA and, and UVB rays. So if the kids don't have a sun shirt, what you can do is just use lightweight cotton clothes. Hold them up to the sunlight. If you see a lot of sun passing through, then maybe you, know, you need something with a tighter weave so that less of the sun rays come through. And also the lighter clothing, too, prevents children from overheating because they do overheat at a much faster rate than adults do. So um, sometimes we tend to, with younger children, especially, especially babies, think that they're going to get cold you know, when, when we're not. So if we're out there sweating, especially today when it feels like it's about 110 <laughs> degrees outside, um, I broke a sweat walking into the office today. Um, you know, we have to remember that our kids do get hot and they overheat a lot faster than we do. Absolutely. Um, the next question was, how to soothe a sunburn? Okay, well, I will always say that the best um, 
intervention is prevention when it comes to sunburn. Okay. But things, you know, do happen and children do, you know, leave the beach with pink cheeks or a little bit of a sunburn. So um, cool compresses do help with that. There are some over the counter things, but I would never recommend an over the counter um, lotion without contacting the pediatrician. And certainly you would want to get med- medical attention if the child develops blisters or a fever or has severe pain that's not um, relieved with cold compresses. Okay. The next question that came in was on the tanning beds. Um, what are your thoughts and comments on tanning beds, especially for our teenagers? Yeah, well, tanning beds have shown in, in recent studies that they do um, lead to skin cancer. So we would definitely want to recommend, especially to adolescents, they, they want to have that base tan before the summertime comes. Maybe they think if they get that initial sunburn, now the rest of the summer they're going to tan. So they may do that in a tanning bed. It, it really is not recommended. Absolutely. Um, the sunless tanners, those are safe. Uh, the bronzers are water-soluble dyes that kind of wash off, and those are okay. There's also the DHA preparations, the misters, which you can get at um, the tanning salons, and those are temporary as well. Those are okay for teenagers, um, but the advice is really just love the skin for your skin. <laughs> you will appreciate it later. <laughs> Absolutely, for sure. All right. Next topic, um, swimming safety. This for Rhonda. <laughs> Which is better, a pool fans or swim lessons? Okay, so when we're talking drowning prevention for children, both of those are best, and I'll explain why. You want to have barriers um, in your home. You recommend at least two barriers. Uh, the state of California just passed the law that there has to be three barriers to prevent a child to get to a pool. Um, remember that a barrier is just that. It's a barrier. Children are quick. Um, so if you only have one, say it's, it's the pool fence, give it enough time, a child would be able to climb that. So you would definitely want on your sliders, front door, whatever um, leads out to the pool, some type of an alarm. The locks on those doors should be moved high enough so that the children can't reach to unlock the door. Um, and in the event that your child does get through those barriers, you would definitely want them to know how to swim or at least at a minimum know how to save themselves by rolling on their back to float until help can get to them. So barriers are definitely a must, but I also feel that swim lessons are a must. Can you give us a few tips on places to go for swim lessons? Sure. Um, You have St. Lucie County Aquatics um, here in St. Lucie County that provides swim lessons at all three of those their pools, which is the Ravenswood Pool, the Lincoln Park Pool, the Lakewood Park Pool. There are uh, several private agencies or entities here in town that provide swim lessons. Um, If you should be in Martin County, you have Martin County uh, Parks and Rec, Selfish Splash, they do swim lessons, as well as the YMCA. Um, And again, in Martin County, they also have um, private businesses or entities that provide lessons. Um, Here in St. Lucie County, Safe Kids has a wonderful partnership with the county and the Sheriff's Department where at least twice a year we provide swim lessons um, to children here in St. Lucie County. We are just finishing up for the month of June, but in November we will be providing lessons um, partnering with our Sheriff's deputies who are certified swim instructors. Can you give us a few tips or pool rules about pool toys? Bikes near the pool, electrical appliances near the pools. <laughs> Absolutely. So your pool is there for recreational fun. Um, there's no reason to have a bicycle out at your pool. I mean, heaven forbid, um, let's just say it's a little colder and the barrier fence is down and the child is riding their bike with long pants and now their pant leg gets caught in the chain of the bike and now they're in the pool. So even if they were to know how to swim, they would have a very difficult time getting them, themselves up and above water because that bike is now pulling them down. Um, electricity can definitely carry in the water um, and can electrocute everyone who is in the water, which is why it's always um, imperative that you check your pool pumps to make sure that there's no shorts, there's no fraying wires that might be back feeding electricity into the pool. Um, Playing around the pool, you know, you want the kids to have a great time in the pool and there's appropriate play and inappropriate play. So when we see children who are wrestling and throwing each other under the water and continually pushing each other under the water, um, 
that could potentially later cause um, something that we call a secondary drowning or non-fatal drowning because you know they've been submerged and pushed under and just playing and later they have a difficulty because they maybe aspirate a little water during that play time or they've held their breath so much um, that they end up having what they call a dry drowning or non-fatal drowning later so it's just very you know when when we're doing lessons it's no running around the pool um, no climbing or pulling on each other because you're putting them at risk for pushing someone under the water. Um, it, it, you know, we're just all about safety. It's really kind of hard to stay in wood until you're right there around the pool. But, you know, our big things are hands off. You don't push and pull on anyone else. And you don't run around the pool deck. Um, and having someone to watch the children, I can't <clears throat> stress enough that there has to be somebody that has their eyes on their children, on the children in the pool and adults. I mean, adults are at risk for drowning also at all times. So we promote a program called Water Watchers and basically that's a, a lanyard with a tag that says Water Watcher. And when you're wearing that lanyard and you have that tag on, you are the one who is responsible for having your eyes on everyone who's in the pool. When you, know, you need to take a break or maybe get out of the sun, then you make sure you pass that lanyard and that tag off to um, someone else to watch the children. Because you always want an adult supervising and watching who's in your pool and who's swimming. And that adult should also yeah, know how to swim. Right. right. Um, and also for really small kids, they should be in arm's reach. Always right. in an arm's reach, yes. Yes. Uh, well, and, you know, we were discussing um, swimmings and flotation devices. Um, if you're going to use a some type of device for your child in the pool, whether it's, you know, swimmies, um, I've seen some of these zip up vests that you can purchase at retail stores. Our recommendation is that you make sure that they're Coast Guard approved. Okay. Um, and when we do our drowning prevention education with parents and children, an actual class that we do, the inflatable swimmies, if you can just honestly take your ballpoint pen and if you hit it hard enough, it pops. So if there would be something, it doesn't have to be extremely sharp in the pool, it can still pop those and now you have a child at risk because, you know, their device that you think is making them safe and secure in the pool is not. So anything that you're going to use to help your child in the pool who may not be able to swim needs to be Coast Guard approved. And it's on the label inside um, if it's Coast Guard approved. If you pick up something at one of the stores and you open it, look on the inside, and there's no writing, it's not Coast Guard approved. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. Uh, what age should swim lessons start? So we recommend that you definitely start getting them used to the water um, between ages one to four. With our program that we run, we do parent-child, so we ask the parent to get in the water with the child um, to help them with the, you know, the fear of the water. Um, and it just kind of keeps it a little calmer, a little smoother for the children. But once they hit that four, then we'll do we'll start with the Red Cross Learn to Swim preschool program where we're working with the children in the pool um, with just an instructor with the parents on the deck. But you definitely need them to start exposing them, you know, at least by the age of one, um, so they can get used to the water. Um, you can begin to teach them to float at that point. So um, there is a program out called Infant Rescue Swim. So that kind of teaches the children that once they get into the water um, to roll on their back and float and to get to the side to exit the pool. And that starts as early as six months. Okay. Um, the next question came in about diving safety. Um, how do you know if it's safe to dive in the pool? Okay, so the American Red Cross has a recommendation that the pool needs to be nine feet deep okay. before you dive. And most pools are not. Are not nine, nine feet deep. deep. Okay, so that's really important. Okay. Um, and then also there are actual diving classes if you're interested in diving or learning how to dive right. correctly. Right. So, um, yes, we can definitely go over some signs of drowning. Drowning is not what you see on TV and the movies, you know, with people coming up and flailing and their arms are splashing. Um, drowning is silent. Most times victims of drowning cannot speak and they can't make a sound so you don't know they're in distress so basically they're in the water and they look like they're trying to climb stairs their head is back their mouth is open and their eyes are really wide that is the first sign that you have someone in the pool who's in distress Excellent. Um, the next topic was boating um, 
safety and beach safety. Um, this question came in, um, my eight year old is an excellent swimmer. Do we really need to wear life jackets when we're on the boat? Well, absolutely. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely they need to wear a life jacket. Yes, yes, yes. Because you can control what's going on on your boat, but you cannot control what's going on in someone else's boat. And heaven forbid there's an accident and your child does not have a life jacket on and they, you know, they sustain some type of injury where maybe they're unconscious. At that point, there is nothing to keep them from drowning in the water um, because you don't know how your status, what your status will be. Um, and... I'm not really familiar with the boating laws, but I do believe it is a law and requirement that every child on the boat have a life jacket. I know every person on the boat has to have a life jacket, right. but I believe the children all have to be wearing it. So um, I can tell you that my children always wore theirs, and my grandchildren will wear one when they're on the boat, just because, like I said, you're, control you're in control of what's going on in your boat, but you are not control in control of the water, the weather conditions, and what someone else on their boat or jet ski may be doing. Right. And being in Florida, even some of our um, children and adolescents are boat drivers. Yes. And there's no minimum age for driving a boat in the state of Florida. However, they do have to have a boater safety education certification, which they can get at a boater's class or online. So that's also very important if our children are going to be operating watercraft. Okay. Excellent. Um, Lori, can you tell us a little bit about how to fit a life jacket correctly? How do you know that you're wearing the right size? Well, again, they have to be Coast Guard approved. And if you go to purchase a life jacket, they do come with age criteria on it. Of course, all kids are different sizes, so you would just have to make sure that once the child was in the life jacket, that it's snug, not too tight, but snug when it's buckled up, and it should always be buckled if they're going to wear it. It's like being on an airplane and being in your seat and having your seatbelt buckled. Um, um, it also shouldn't be too much up around their neck. If the child is small, sometimes it works its way up. And young children really don't like to wear life jackets, so it's important that you get them used to it very early on. And um, in preparation for our Facebook Live today, I did look up the voting laws for children in life vests. And it's definitely under the age of six. It's mandatory to wear a life vest. And as Rhonda mentioned, highly recommended because you never know what's gonna happen, you know, on the boat. Can water wings be used as in place of a life jacket? Absolutely not. It must be a Coast Guard approved life jacket. Okay. And can you comment on what to do if you are caught in a rip current? Okay. Well, my first suggestion is um, we have a lot of different waterways in Florida. We have the ocean, we have the intracoastal, we have canals, rivers, there's water pretty much anywhere you look, which is wonderful. We live in a beautiful place, but it also comes with risks. So um, the best recommendation is to swim in designated swimming areas. So if you're going to take your children to the beach, we have beaches that are guarded by professional lifeguards. And they're there not just to save someone in the water if they're in distress, but they monitor the weather, they monitor the currents and the rip tides, they monitor whether there's, you know, the critters that live in the ocean are in abundance at the beach. And so when you get to those guarded beaches, you see the sign where the lifeguard keeps it updated all the time. Um, so usually there'll be a warning there if the rip currents are too strong and swimming is prohibited. But if you're just not sure, um, you can tell where there are those rip currents because there's a line of water that looks darker. You can see the water breaking at certain points. And if a child or an adult, anyone, gets caught in a rip current, the recommendation is that you do not fight it because you can't swim to shore across a rip current and all you will do would be just to get exhausted at that point. So you should really just kind of either float with the current or swim parallel to the shore until you feel the rip current let loose and then you're able to make it to shore. Excellent. But again, as you mentioned earlier, if you're gonna take your young children to the beach, they should always be within arm's reach so that you could grab onto them if you needed to. Excellent. Uh, the next topic that came up were lightning storms. Um, where should I shelter during a storm? What are good places to shelter? Rhonda, do you 
Well, you definitely um, want to get inside. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to be outside. You do not want to get under a tree. Um, you know, lightning is attracted coming down to the trees. It's going to hit the tree. You're under the tree now. You've been struck. So you definitely want to get yourself inside, um, even if it's in your car. So you go inside your car, sit in your car, just make sure you're not touching thing, anything metal, just in case, you know, your car were to sustain a strike. You're not touching anything in your car that's metal. Um, that could have the lightning come through. So Lori may have more to add to that, but. Well, um, sometimes, you know, we are in thunderstorm season right now and thunderstorms pop up very quickly sometimes. Um, if you're gonna spend a day outdoors, especially at the beach, take a look at the weather and the radar before you go. So, Absolutely. you know, there may be some forewarning that there are some thunderstorms that are gonna be approaching. Um, but if you do see some clouds, if you do see some lightning, if you do hear thunder, that is the time that you want to get out of the water, dry off, find a good shelter, as Rhonda mentioned. And really, when you hear thunder, there is light in the area. Absolutely. So even if you don't see the lightning or, or hear it. And the recommendation is that you don't go out of your sheltered area until 30 minutes after that last thunder. Excellent. Um, another thing is that you want to avoid um, open places, the metal sheds, picnic shelters like you see at the beaches, Absolutely. Um, and the baseball dugouts. Those are not safe places right. to shelter. Really, right. get into your car. Okay. Um, next topic. Oh, this one has unfortunately been on the news more recently. Preventing the hot car related deaths. Both of you give us some tips on preventing those type of deaths. Or first, describe what what a hot car related death is. So, really, what a hot car related death is, um, it can happen in a couple of ways. One, a child who's accidentally forgotten um, because maybe the parent pattern changes, and it's not the parent who normally drops the child um, at daycare or to the babysitter. Um, and I know that we have a lot of people who say. You know, how can anybody forget their child? But you have to realize that we live in a society now where we have technology at our fingertips all the time. Um, and it's a fast-paced world and we're, we're distracted. So if your routine changes and you're not the one who normally is taking the child, or if you are, but your routine has changed, it is very possible that you could go straight to work um, instead of to the child care facility. And you get in with your busy day and it's not until much later that you've realized you've left your child in the vehicle. Um, then you also have the children who um, they're outside playing with their friends and they're playing hide and seek and they gain access to a family member's um, keys and they they go in the car to hide. Um, and believe it or not, you know, we just had a, we had a six year old in Florida last year who didn't get out of the car and passed away from a heat related death. And you would think, okay, it's six. They should have realized when they couldn't get out through the back door, the child box were on to jump over the seat and come out the front door, but they're children. Mm -hmm. And so their minds don't think like ours. So it was truly, you know, any death is tragic, but you know, when you see an older child and they're just playing a game and it's hide and seek, um, it was just really tragic. So our recommendation is that you always keep your keys and your key fob high and away from your children so that they can't gain access to your vehicle. Keep all vehicles that are in your driveway locked so they can't gain access. Um, there are definitely some things that you can do to remind yourself that you have your child in the car with you in the car seat. Not to mention they have car seats now that have sensors on them um, that plug, right? So they have car seats now that on that harness clip when you close it, um, there's a little, in your little fuse, um, like box in your car, there's a little fuse that plugs in to your car. And so what it does is when your ignition turns off, that harness clip starts sounding off an alarm to remind you that you need to check. So, you know, they're, they're a little pricey. So if you can't afford a car seat like that, here's some things you can do. So put your purse in the back seat. Put your cell phone in the back seat. Because yeah. I can promise you, you won't get in your office too long without looking for your cell phone. Um, we, I've had, you know, some, some people also recommend that you take your shoe off, take off one shoe and put it in the back seat near the car seat. And that will remind you that you have left a child. Um, because what happens is they overheat, you know, um, and once they get to 104 degrees, then they start into organ failure. And so it doesn't take very long, especially in Florida, to reach 104 degrees in a car for this child to start showing signs that, um, 
their organs are shutting down, and then you know they, they will eventually pass because it's so hot. Right. And if you see a child in a car by themselves, or even an animal, call 911 right away. And if you can gain access, you can gain access to that child. And, uh, you know, even if it means that you have to break a window to get in, um, you're within legal rights to do that to help the child before EMS arrives. Excellent. Um, the next topic, snake bites. Um, what are some poisonous snakes in Florida? And what should I do if my child is actually bit by a snake? Yeah, I don't do snakes very well, <laughs> so I will run. But um, but children are inquisitive, and they you know they may think snakes are fun to play with. But luckily in Florida, um, most of our snakes are not aggressive. They're not going to go after you. Um, most people get bit by snakes when they accidentally step on them in the woods, or they go to handle a snake. In Florida, we do have um, a few species of snakes that are poisonous. We have a few different types of rattlesnakes that we all are aware of. We have copperhead snakes, water moccasins, and we have coral snakes. And I was going to look up the little rhyme about coral snakes and their little colors, you know, red and yellow and black. But I thought, you know what? Who's going to stand there and do the little nursery rhyme before they run away from that snake, which is the That's recommendation. <laughs> but, um, but if you, first of all, if you feel like your child has been bitten by a snake, regardless of whether you know what type it was or not, they do need to have medical attention right away, okay? Um, if you can safely get a picture of the snake, or if someone is brave enough to kill the snake, then it's nice to be able to take that snake or the picture of the snake with the child to the emergency room so that they know exactly what type of snake it was and what kind of anti-venom that the child would need. So what you'd also be looking for, maybe two small puncture wounds, a half inch in heart, or sometimes it's just one bang that gets them, you know, the child get bit by just one bang. They have a lot of burning, um, and it's very rapid swelling um, and discoloration, like blood-filled blisters, the area turns red, um, they might have nausea, vomiting, um, sweating, or even trouble breathing. Um, so agree, get the child and others away from the snake, yeah. and keep the child quiet and the body part still. Um, you also want to keep that body part uh, lower than the child's heart, okay? So that helps to prevent the spread of the venom. Okay, and then of course call EMS for poison control as well. Right. Anything else? Well, the, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, one, realize we're going into the rainy season, and we, for in May, when we had two weeks where it seemed like it was never going to stop raining. <laughs> and when that happens, um, all wildlife really is, is displaced. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be active, they're going to be out, and they're going to be moving around more. So just be more cautious in your yard, like in your flower beds and around your trees. And you know, if you've cut a tree down and maybe you're waiting for um, waste to grow to pick it up, um, be aware that snakes will look to hide in that shade um, once they've been misplaced. Topic. Oh, I was talking to Lori today about <laughs> ATVs and mudding, and I said when we first moved down from Philly, I had no idea what mudding was. So this next topic is about mudding and ATV use, and what age can my child start riding an ATV? Ah, uh, well, it, I I don't know the what the law says about the exact age, um, but again, it is a motor vehicle. So they have to have the same safety precautions, wearing helmets, definitely. Yeah, the um, AP recommends that children under 60 mm -hmm. are not on the, a, uh, the ATV. Um, they also recommend, of course, your helmets. Um, right. And you want to have a motorcycle helmet as opposed to just a regular bike helmet. Um, and then riding double should not be permitted. Right. And also to not use your ATV or four-wheeler on the street. No, I mean, that covers it. I mean, I'm, just in my neighborhood here in Port St. Lucie, mm -hmm. we see a lot of children out on ATVs, um, much younger than 16, um, without helmets. And... I think if parents are gonna buy their children ATVs and let them ride it, that's a wonderful thing, but we should follow the rules. They're set there for a reason. Um, and you know, when we teach our bicycle pedestrian safety lessons through our Safe Roads to School program, we always tell the kids, you know, you can only get one brain. 
Mm -hmm. if, and if you permanently damage it, it, it's not fixable. So why take that risk? You know, they, they mm -hmm. need to wear a helmet and it should be a motorcycle helmet, not a bike helmet. So, Robin, can you also comment, we're moving on to RV travel. We know it's summertime right. and families are going on vacation. Um, if you could comment on car seats in the RV. Okay. So, the child passenger safety laws in Florida don't change just because you're driving in an RV. Um, every child in your vehicle, six years and younger by law, has to be in an appropriate child restraint. So, when you're traveling in an RV, they still need to be in their appropriate child restraint in a seat that faces forward in the RV. Um, putting them in a child restraint on a side facing seat is not legal in any vehicle. Um, so, I mean, is that, is that cut and dry, that plain and simple? You don't want them flying through the RV. Heaven forbid you sh they should be in an accident. They're just a missile that's gonna keep flying and bouncing off everything that's inside the RV. Um, so the laws don't change. It's still a motor vehicle. They still have to be in a child restraint. Um, and it still needs to be the appropriate child restraint for them. So if they do not have enough front-facing seats for you know, right. number of children, what should they do? So most people will tow a car behind their RV. Um, and if you're going to tow a car, you then have a second driver drive the car. Um, if you're not planning to tow a vehicle, then you should have someone else um, who's traveling with you drive a car to properly restrain your children. All right. Next topic, a hot topic, trampoline safety. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, <I'm sorry. laughs> okay. Here we go. Oh, this one is um, my nephew wants to get a trampoline for the backyard. Is this recommended? Who wants to take that one? Well, <laughs> no, it is not recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics um, because there's so many injuries that can happen. Um, with trampolines. It can be a trampoline in your backyard or even at some of the trampoline parks that are out there. However, my children had a trampoline when they were young. I know that people are still going to have trampolines. So there are a lot of different safety mechanisms that can be in, put in place to prevent kids you know, from obtaining injuries from trampolines. For example, only one child on a trampoline at a time Okay, um, supervision, and supervision really goes with everything that we're talking about today, um, adult supervision. Um, always check in the trampoline to see if there's anything that's broken on it, is the safety netting around it broken. Um, we've all seen trampolines that during a storm go flying through the air, so we want to make sure trampolines are, you know, secure and anchored on, on the ground. Um, try to prevent children from doing stunts on the trampoline. You know, they're not just going to stand and jump up and down for an hour, but they're going to try flips and somersaults and all different kinds of things. So they really need to be discouraged from doing that because not only can they end up with broken bones, they can end up with neck and back injuries as well. So also if there's um, adequate padding and protective um, equipment on the trampoline, make sure it's in good condition and replace it if you're not. If there is no net on the trampoline, don't get on it. Right, right, right. right. It's another layer of uh, precaution there. And it's important, too, to know if your children are going to a neighbor's house, a friend's house, you know, what, what kinds of things are there for the children? Do they have a pool wall? Do, do they have a trampoline? What kind of playground equipment? And you want to teach your children, you know, not just supervise them, but teach them how to be safe around, you know, because they may not always be with their parents. Um, some of the common injuries that we see from trampolines are broken bones, head and neck injuries, which tend to be the most serious. Um, you know, most uh, you know, cannot come back from a head or neck injury. Mm -hmm. uh, concussions, sprains, uh, bruises, um, and children younger than the age of six are at the greatest risk of injury. Okay, so it's the little ones. Right. Um, next one is bike safety. Um, I wanted to get a new bike for my child. Uh, can I get a bike that's a bit too big and kind of let it grow into it? Okay, so no, we don't recommend that you get a bike that's a bit too big. The seats on the bicycles are adjustable. So to know if a bike is the proper fit for your child, when they sit on the seat, their toes should be just touching on the ground. That's how you know that one, the seat's in the right position and that the bike um, is appropriate for your child. Getting a bike that's too big for them 
is really going to increase their risk um, of getting injured when they fall because they're not able to put their feet down before that whole bike is, is down. So no, we want to make sure that you're getting a bike that fits them appropriately. And what type of brake should that first bike be? At the hand brakes or the foot brakes? A lot of the bikes now are coming with both. Um, however, I mean, you know your child best. Um, what we've noticed when we're doing our bike rodeos at the school for children who may not get to bike, uh, ride bikes often is that they don't get the concept the younger ones are pedaling backwards to stop the bike. So in that case, the hand brakes might be a little better. Um, most retail stores you go into, I mean, not that I want your child riding the bike through the store, but they do have that aisle where the bikes are. Maybe just let them kind of push it a little bit with their feet, maybe a couple of turns and see if they can back pedal to stop the bike. Um, and if not, then maybe you do want to go to a handbrake. Okay. And this question came in about the uh, the helmets. Can we use my son's old football helmet um, instead of investing in a new bike helmet? Um, I'm going to go with no. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I'm going to go with no. Okay. So to properly fit a helmet, and I hope you all can see, so this will probably explain. When you put a helmet on a child's head, it should fit flat down on their head two fingers above their eyebrow. Their two fingers, not yours, okay? Um, if you can't get them to do this, because some can be a little stubborn, if they can look up and see the top of the helmet, then that's okay also. The straps that come down to adjust should make a V at the earlobe, okay? Then you tighten it. It should be so snug, again, their two fingers, not yours, that only their two fingers can get under the chin strap, okay? You're not gonna get that from a football helmet. And so that means it's going to come off should they fall off the bike. And in the state of Florida, anyone riding a bike or a passenger on a bike less than 16 years of age must wear a helmet. Correct. Excellent. Um, how can my kid ride safely at night? So if you're riding your bike at night, because um, a bicycle is considered a motor vehicle in the state of Florida, which means that anyone riding a bicycle must follow the same traffic laws that we follow when we're driving our car. So when we're driving our car at night, we have to have headlights and taillights. So if you're riding your bike at night, there, you have to have a headlight and you have to have taillights. Um, we're going to recommend that you are wearing something that's reflective or light colored clothes. You don't want dark clothes because us as drivers, it's very difficult to see someone um, if it's dark. You know, even if they maybe just have reflectors on the pedals, because sometimes that's what you'll see, the reflectors are on the pedals, but everything else is dark and you can't see them. So um, you want to be light and bright at night, okay? And you want to have retroreflective if possible and a tail light and a headlight. Excellent. Okay. And our last topic quickly is the green-blue algae. Yeah, that's also been um, in the news, a lot of talk about that in our area over actually the last year or two. So blue-green algae is, is actually a normal flora in the water in Florida. Um, it grows in fresh water, it can be in salt water, and it can grow especially where fresh and salt water meet. So as you know, we do have discharges from Freshwater Lake here. Um, occasionally when we've had a lot of rain, like those two weeks that we had, so water is discharged from freshwater source out to the ocean, and that interrupts that normal flora and the blue-green algae can grow. What it looks like, it looks foamy, it makes the water look murky, it can actually be blue-green, reddish color, brownish color. Um, we all know the beautiful water we have here and how clear and blue green it is sometimes. You can definitely tell most of the time when there's a problem with the blue green algae. Luckily, when we've had some massive blooms, um, the authorities have gone out and posted signs to say don't swim in certain areas. So we definitely want to pay attention to those signs. However, before those signs go, go up, there may be you know a chance that Children, in particular, who don't understand, can end up swimming in water like that. So if you feel like your child perhaps was exposed to blue-green algae in the water, um, they may swallow some of that water in. If they're showing any signs of illness whatsoever, fever, nausea and vomiting, if they have a little cut or scrape that they had prior to going in the water, keep an eye on it, make sure it doesn't you know, get infected, look reddish, um, but basically, get them in the shower or the bathtub, get that washed off of them with soap and water. Excellent, excellent. 
Um, then Rhonda, you had brought some wonderful safety items for us. <laughs> I'll just go through them really quickly for you. Sure. So these are all um, products that you can purchase and you can use in your home um, to create barriers. Because you, you'll hear me say this a hundred times. A barrier is just that. It's just to slow the child down long enough. Um, for you to realize that maybe they're doing something they shouldn't do. So these are um, doorknob covers. They go on the doorknob so that it's a little more difficult for them to twist the doorknob to get into a room they shouldn't get into or get outside the front door. Um, we have two different types of, and I'm not promoting any one product, so. We have two different types of um, cabinet locks to keep them out of the cabinets so that they're not getting into items that you're maybe storing under your cabinet that you don't want, like you have over here, you don't want them to. Um, these are just a couple of different ideas for outlet covers. This is just the larger one that covers the whole outlet, um, the sockets and all. And then these are just the little plugs that go into the outlets. Um, children are very curious, so not only will they stick their fingers in the outlet, but they will find objects to stick in the outlet. And now you're looking at them getting a little shock um, this is just a little piece that goes on the door to keep them from smashing their little fingers, you know, cause maybe it is their bedroom door that stays open, but you know, they'll play, um, and look at the finger smash. So this can prevent that. Um, this is actually an appliance lock so that you can lock the refrigerator, you can lock the dishwasher, you can lock this oven so that they're not able to access that. These are cute little ducks that are, are sold in the store, red, but it's hot, blue is that it's okay. So the water's not too hot for them. Um, I know you can't really see this really well, but this is actually a little tool that you can purchase. And basically, if a toy or an object can go in here, your child can swallow it and choke over it. Um, I just want to point out, this is actually larger than you think. Right. So you can actually see the diameter of it. Yeah, so like a matchbox car actually will fit in there. Um, this is for medications. We always recommend that you keep medications high and away from children. Um, preferably in something that locks. So you can use an old toolbox if you, you know, don't have the means or the finances to go out and buy an, an actual um, device that is intended to lock up medication. So you can use a toolbox with a padlock on it. But they do have these cute little things that have a combination lock on the top that you just pour your prescription in and close it up. And in the hospital, um, I just want to add that, you know, we do sometimes send children home with medication. We never want to refer to medication as candy to children. Right. You know, because then they won't understand if they do find medication, they may think it looks like candy. Right. So these probably are the most important things. Um, we know children are quick, children are fast, and children climb. So you should tether your... Um, bookcases, dressers, um, TV stands, any type of furniture that you think your child would climb on that would tip over on them and cause serious injury, go ahead and just tether it to the wall. So that's basically what this is. It's just a little tether. This is a wall mount. So if you have a flat screen TV and you have the ability to, to mount it on the wall, um, go ahead and, and mount it on the wall. That way, if that child does start climbing, that TV doesn't tip over and land on top of them. And then we have our Tide Pods. Yes. Okay. I know people, it's so funny, people are like, why would kids eat, kids eat Tide Pods? Because they look like candy. Okay? A two-year-old doesn't know the difference between this looking like a, a, a laundry pod or candy that's just wrapped in cellophane. So that's why they would do that. And if your child, by chance, unfortunately gets to a Tide Pod, please take them to the hospital. This is a concentrated dose of laundry soap. So they need to be, you need to seek medical attention for them. Um, keep them high and away so the kids can't reach them. Um, you know, on a shelf above the washing machine so that they have to really do some working to get up there to get to it. You want to do that. Um, the last thing I'll mention, and I didn't bring a whole lot of um, items with me, are button batteries. Button batteries are really dangerous for children. They can be found on a lot of places in your home that you're not even thinking. And those are just the little round batteries that are in your key fob. They're in your remote controls. They're, um, you know, greeting cards that play music have button batteries. Um, and let's face it, I mean, if it'll entertain them while you're riding in the car, then we let them play with it, not realizing that that's a danger. Um, the, the books that the kids play with that, you know, make the, the sounds for animals when you're reading a story. They're great books, but they should always be supervised when they're playing with those because of those button batteries. And so 
what happens is when they swallow the button batteries, it doesn't always cause them to choke right away. And if you think of what a battery is doing, it is creating electricity for a device to function. And so now that current, that electrical current has met with the moisture within the body and it starts burning like an acid and it can burn through the esophagus. And if it makes it to the stomach, you know, continue to burn into the stomach and into the intestines um, and it, it can cause quite serious problems. So you want to just, be really cognizant of the devices in your home that your children have access to, like the TV remote controls that could possibly have those batteries. Oh, I saw a recent recommendation that if a child does mm -hmm. swallow one of those button, uh, button batteries to give honey right away um, right. on route to the ER. Okay, so thank you to the ER, but definitely give some honey right away. Okay. Uh, we did get one last question sent in. Um, on insect bites and how to tell the difference between your mosquito bite, your bed bug bite. Right, so it's summer in Florida and we do have a lot of insect critters up there. Um, so first I'll talk about ticks. And again, with ticks, they live in wooded areas. So if part of your activities during the summer is to go to wooded parks or go for hikes or go camping, it's always a good idea once that activity is over to check your children and check your pets for ticks. And ticks are arachnids, they have eight legs so you can tell what a tick looks like. And what they will do is they will bury their head into the skin and they feed on blood from whatever host they're on. So um, to remove a tick, you wanna make sure you remove the entire tick, okay? Um, so if you're checking your child or your pet and you find a tick, the tick will have its head burrowed so you want to use tweezers and get as close to the skin as possible to remove the entire tick and not accidentally break off the body from the head and leave the head in. Um, they do cause a reddened bite mark, okay? And sometimes it can actually look like a circular, a reddish circular bite. Um, and if the child, usually it just causes a little bit of pain, a little bit of itching, but if the child develops a fever, lethargy, nausea, vomiting, any other symptoms that you're concerned about, you know your child, make sure that you um, contact the pediatrician or take the child to the emergency room. We also have a tremendous amount of fire ants here in Florida. I was just um, in, a, in a grassy parking lot earlier today and stepped out of the car and almost stepped into a fire ant mound. Um, so if, again, prevention is always the key. So if you're going to be at the park on a picnic or have an activity in your backyard or anywhere where it's a grassy area, look for those fire ant mounds, first of all, um, and try to avoid those areas. However, if your child does end up stepping in a fire ant mound, you want to make sure you get their shoes off, get those pants off if they're wearing long pants because the ants can crawl up very quickly and get in places where you can't see them and then they'll continue to bite the child. They do look like red welts. They are very painful when they're first bitten and then they turn um, very itchy. You can use cold compresses and antihistamine, calamide lotion to prevent some of that pain and itching. Um, but you want to try everything you can and it's difficult with children to prevent them from scratching because what will happen is they will scratch, which is normal, um, but if they break that skin, then they're at risk for a secondary infection that we wouldn't want. Um, bed bugs are exactly that. They live in our mattresses, they live in pillows, um, and bed bugs, typically when they bite, it looks like a linear line. It's not random like a lot of other bugs like mosquitoes or ants or, or other, um, other insects. And again, it's red, it's, it's itchy. So if you find um, that you do have bed bugs, then um, you want to be very careful because they can spread quickly. There's actually a recommendation that if you're in a hotel, not to put your suitcase on a mattress or on furniture or the floor because you can carry those things home. So you would um, need to do some exterminating, wash all your sheets and blankets and get rid of your pillows and all those different things to get rid of, get rid of bed bugs. Um, there are actually dogs out there that can sniff for bed bugs. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, yes, okay. yeah, yeah. They will go in if, if a, you know, a hotel or a hospital or some other, you know, um, business thinks that they have may have a problem with bed bugs. They can send dogs in who actually can sniff them out. So just a little tidbit. Um, and then, of course, we have mosquitoes. So to prevent mosquito bites, we do want to use repellent with DEET. Not in babies less than two months, however. We would not want to use it. 
but a good prevention is to stay out from the out of doors during dusk and during dawn. Those are the times when mosquitoes are the most prevalent. If you are going to be out during those times, wear long sleeves, long pants, wear your insect repellent. Um, you know, if children do get bitten or anybody gets bitten, it looks like a red well. And again, it's very itchy. You can use the cold compresses, the calamine lotion. Um, but again, if there's any other symptoms, you would want to pay attention. Spray your off deep woods onto the child's clothes. Let the clothes sit 20 minutes. And and let them go yep. out of place. So yeah, they're protected you know, through the clothes as well. Absolutely. Um, just going back to removing the tick. What not to use with cigarettes, <laughs> nail oh, polish yeah. remover. Yeah, yes, oh, matches. Yes. Wow. Right. So the tweezers, yes. Right. The tweezers. <laughs> Definitely. You know, you'll find a lot of um, recommendations, old wives tales, right. you know, some of the things that, you know, people used to use years ago. You know, we want to make sure that we use um, current current information you know, that's appropriate. And that also goes along with, you know, when you're at the beach, um, critters in the ocean, jellyfish. Luckily, we don't have poisonous jellyfish here in Florida. However, they do cause quite a sting. And you may know that one of the wives' tales is that if someone gets stung by a jellyfish, what do you do? You urinate on them. <laughs> and that's, that is not the recommendation. The recommendation is actually running cold water for warm water for 20 minutes or using vinegar. So, so you want that fresh water. Absolutely, absolutely. When my daughter was young, she actually picked up a jellyfish that was dead on the beach and the tentacles still sure. stung her, you know? So it's not just live jelly, jellyfish in the water. So if you do think your child was stung by a jellyfish, you would want to do those things, the warm water and the vinegar, but also look to see if you see any barbs that are left and take those out with tweezers as well. Excellent. Well, I hope we've answered all of your questions today. And if we have not, please give me a call, 772-301-0123 at Optimal Care Pediatrics. And we are going to post Lori's contact information and Rhonda's contact information as well on our Facebook page. If you have any other questions and you want to send them in through Facebook, that is fine. I wish you all, all the best. Take care and thank you for joining us. Thank you.